the female Anopheles mosquito feeding, with her body held high in a straight line with her long beak. Here you have um, Alphonse Lavera. He was a uh, French military surgeon, and uh, he won the Nobel Prize for first recognizing that malaria parasites could be identified in the blood of patients who were suffering from, from fevers. And what he, uh, he observed, he drew. And uh, uh, these are drawings of uh, the shapes of the parasites that he observed in the patient's blood using a microscope. So this uh, short video reproduces the uh, observations, we think, that uh, Lavera made. And here you see the red cells infected, and you can see these thread-like moving organisms, which are the male gametes emerging from the infected red cells uh, after they've been put onto a, a microscope slide. And this is obviously an unfixed sample taken straight from culture. Now, that's the history of the microscopy of malaria, but there have been many problems um, with uh, the diagnosis of malaria. With the saliva, malaria germs are carried into the blood. This man has acquired malaria. Traditionally, why has it been difficult to diagnose malaria? I think it's because the mainstay of diagnosis has relied on microscopy, which, uh, again, hasn't changed for the diagnosis of malaria in the last uh, 100 years or so since uh, Lavera first made his observations. And whilst it's easy to imagine um, how microscopy could help in the diagnosis of malaria, the process it's, itself involves many complex steps. And then taking all this procedure into account, you still have to have somebody who can look at the, micros uh, the microscope slide, spend time, who's trained to understand what they're looking at so that they can distinguish between parasites and things that might be artifacts, for example, and come to a confident diagnosis. For example, here's an open access publication in the Malaria Journal uh, by Lee and colleagues, which was published in 2009. And it shows really nicely one of the problems with microscopy of malaria. So this is work carried out in Malaysian Borneo, and it shows a new species of parasite that infects humans called Plasmodium nolzi, which is usually a monkey malaria. And if you look here at the parasites stained on these blood films, these are all Plasmodium nolzi at different stages of development. Look, depending on the stage, it becomes very hard to tell the difference on this microscope slide between the Noel's eye and related parasites like Plasmodium falciparum or Plasmodium malariae. And this is when you've got really well stained, beautifully stained uh, specimens. And even with these, and with all the experience that we have, it can be very difficult to distinguish the species of malaria. Now, uh, you know, whilst it's been very hard in low resource settings, the, there are advances that have been made, for example, in the rapid diagnostic tests used for diagnosis of malaria. And these are much simpler to use because you just need a drop of blood. It has to be treated in a certain way on your diagnostic test. And then a result comes back within a, a few minutes. But, uh, and these tests are now recommended by the World Health Organization as a way of deciding whether somebody should actually get treated for malaria or not. But the tests themselves also have certain issues. So they're not always as sensitive as, um, for example, really experienced microscopy could be, or some of the more uh, innovative new tests that are coming along that require, for example, more expensive laboratory equipment. And the other interesting thing about these rapid diagnostic tests is that even when uh, people who are out working in areas where there is malaria, when they get the results, they don't always act on the results. 
So that, for example, even if a test is negative, they'll carry on treating patients as though they have malaria. And uh, so there are, there are questions always that arise about the best way to use these tests in practice, and not only about just how good the tests might be. Scientists continually study the mosquitoes that carry diseases. They seek new ways to control and destroy them. We're obviously working ourselves uh, with a company uh, to try and develop uh, what we think ought to be, well, what we're pretty confident ought to be the next generation of test. The group that is funded actually by the European Union uh, has brought together industry, and the industry partner is called Quantum DX, uh, with whom we're developing this test for malaria. But we mustn't forget that what I'm going to describe to you is a platform technology. So it can be turned to, towards other infections uh, that would need um, immediate diagnosis as well. We're also working with uh, Dr. Pedro Gil in Stockholm, in Karolinska Institute, uh, as, a, as a partner in this collaborative venture, and also Professor Peter Kremsner, who heads up a unit um, in Tübingen, in Germany, and that unit is linked to a research centre, the Albert Schweitzer Hospital in Gabon. So, so if I can tell you a little bit about the characteristics of what I think would make this type of approach really, uh, really much more strong than the current tests. And let's say approaching ideal. I mean, in a sense, ideal is beyond reach anyway, isn't it? Because it's an ideal. But let's, let's tell you what we're aiming for. I think uh, it goes without saying, malaria is a disease um, of less developed countries, of people who are deprived. The test has to be affordable. I think it has to be really much more accurate than the current tests because um, you need to be accurate in terms of sensitivity to be able to pick up low numbers of parasites and this actually becomes very important when you're trying to move towards the eradication of parasites because you end up with more people who are walking around with very few parasites in the blood and you need to be able to detect those that means it, it has to be more sensitive uh, and also sometimes more specific than some of the tests that are available. And by this I mean it shouldn't just be able to distinguish some of the, let's say, the two commonest species of malaria, Plasmodium falciparum and Plasmodium vivax, but we ought to be able to end up with a diagnosis of all the five common species of, of malaria specifically. I think the other thing is it has to be really simple. It has to be so simple to use that almost anybody could use it. Um, almost uh, like some of the best um, computers that have been developed which are so easy and intuitive and user-friendly to use. I think there are a few other things as well that, uh, that are worth aiming for in the ideal test. Uh, it has to be something that is standalone. In other words, you don't need uh, a ready supply of electricity for, for being able to use it. It has to be tough because it's, it's, it's going to be run in tropical environments. Um, and another feature which uh, I think would be wonderful to have built into this would be the ability for information that's collected on this test to be communicated using the up-and-coming technologies or the existing technologies. Uh, that are available for communication. So that's a test for malaria. But what we'd like to do is to go one step further. And that is not, not just be able to say if somebody has malaria in their blood and what species it is, but also to be able to um, select the best treatment for that patient. And so <clears throat> what we're aiming for is a test that in less than 15 minutes will give us an answer to these types of questions. And I think in essence what this means is precision medicine, really focused treatment right next to the patient where the patient needs it most. And that's 
if you like, bringing, you know, a revolutionary technology where it never existed before.